Welcome to the Francisca Show podcast on jewishcoffeehouse.com, the show where I give a voice to Jewish issues, topics, and people. I'm Francisca, your host. This is the 200th episode on the Francisca Show. Congratulations. I want to start off by thanking all of you for joining and tuning in, participating in discussions, and sending me private messages and Thank you to all my guests. Thanks to all my behind-the-scenes support system. And I also want to thank all the guests who have rejected coming onto the show over the years because they definitely keep me on my toes and aligned with our mission here. I'm just so grateful to be doing this work, and I'm so happy with all the benefits that have happened behind the scenes because of these stories coming out and the voices being shared and the topics being discussed. So thank you. This all happens thanks to you, your support, and of course, the Ribbon Shalom. I'd also like to mention that I just released a new English song in honor of my wedding anniversary. So please check out the link. It's in the show notes. Enjoy it. Without any further ado, let's get started. I am so delighted to be here today with you. This is our 200th episode, and it was quite a journey finding a guest who would say yes to speaking about the Asifa that happened almost two weeks ago. The reason I wanted to use this discussion for this 200th episode is because a lot of the stuff we do on the podcast is based and came from a place of wanting to give women a voice. We started off by giving women a voice in the Jewish women in arts entertainment space. Then we went to survivors of abuse. And now we just talk about all the stuff going on in the Jewish Orthodox community. And the Sasifa was definitely a threatening event slash scary. We don't know what to think. And what better way to celebrate the journey of this podcast than to address what happened, what was so triggering for so many people, why it was successful on so many levels to some people. And we have the greatest guest who thankfully said yes to come on here. She's a second timer on this podcast. If you haven't listened to the first episode with our guest, check out the first episode on the coverage of my unorthodox life on Netflix. Anyway, Dr. Efra Brooke, welcome back to the show. It's so good to have you here. Thank you. I'm honored to be on your really special 200th episode. Thank you for having me. It's really an honor. You participate in the discussion group a lot and you bring a lot of value and great talking points and you challenge people, especially people who aren't exposed to your train of thought. And I appreciate the openness and the discussion that happens. So thank you for participating and caring enough to speak. Yeah, it's actually a really uh, important outlet for me to be able to wash my brain throughout the day from like what I'm doing at work. I really enjoy being on a chat. I'm happy to hear that. Thank you. I think we'll go ahead and get started. Let's talk about the event, which I actually only found out about through this discussion group. (laughs) Like I only know about it thanks to the people who listen to this podcast because they were purposefully not advertising the event on social media. But what's up is social media. So we'll talk about that more. The event Nikadesh, let's just talk about some of the facts that may need some clarification. I didn't uh, obviously physically attend the event, but I listened to a good, probably the majority of it, only one of the nights. I listened to a couple of speeches. I just had like my phone next to me and listened as I was going through like my evening routine and before I went to bed. Some people have asked me why I did that. The simple answer is old habits die hard. (laughs) And this is the world I come from. And this is the stuff I grew up with. And this is the stuff that I was very immersed in for a large part of my life. And much as I moved on and have a different setup in my life, part of me actually enjoys these things sometimes. I don't know if I enjoy this event, but It was a combination of like curiosity, wanting to know, did anything change since I was in high school and seminary and the post-seminary inspiration? Do they do things differently? Are there different speakers? Remarkably, I think like one of the speakers was someone who spoke at one of my high schools. So like, I just, I wanted to see what's going on. And I was curious. I was actually surprised when you told me that you tuned in because there was no way I was going to (laughs) tune into that. I didn't plan on tuning in, but had a relatively early evening. I was home by like six or something and I just needed to decompress. So it was like either watching a movie or 
or doing something else, just decompress from the day where I can listen to this Nakadesh thing, which I just like, I don't even know where I got the link from. Was it from the WhatsApp chat? I don't even remember. But like there was a leak sitting in front of me and I was like, let me see what's going on. I'm curious. <laughs> well, for the purpose of this episode, I did do some research and I spoke to a lot of women who did attend but we're not willing to come on and speak about it on the podcast. So I just yeah. want to put that qualified. I think, and I think that's fair for some people there. I can think of a lot of reasons they wouldn't want to talk about it publicly, but for me, I, I don't really think I have much to lose. So I'm happy to be here. <laughs> Those are great standards. There were two events. One was Hasidish, one was Yeshivish and the Hasidish one was in Yiddish. The Yeshivish one was in English. They requested that no one live tweet slash stream on social media because of the... That was sort of, of the, the yes. actual <laughs> event. But they did successfully fill up a stadium two nights in a row filled with Orthodox Jewish women, which is very impressive. And another misinformation thing that was going around was that there were no female speakers. I know for a fact... Oh, there, there were. Yeah. So there were female speakers for those who didn't attend. Oh, for and then sure. the sense I got was the women who did event were very happy and inspired by the event. And the people who didn't were hating on the event <laughs> and misrepresenting what was happening. So I'd like to touch upon all the different things. And at the end, I'll share a little bit why it was perhaps a little threatening or triggering for me to even consider listening. Yeah. And I was on an emotional <laughs> roller coaster last week a little bit because of it also. Let's start off with, just tell us what were the talking points? What was the energy like? What did they talk about? Yeah, before I get to that, I think you touched on something important that we shouldn't ignore, that this community, this section of the firm world got 40,000 women to fill up a stadium, right? These are busy women with families, large families, they have a lot to do. It's not so easy to just pick up and make it to a night out. And I think that's impressive. And I think it talks to the power this community has in their ability to get something done. And this is something that I often, very happy to give credit to the way I grew up. People are like, well, how did you do med school and a family and this, and I run a business and all that. And I'm like, look, this is how we grow up. Like stuff gets done, that's how it is. And there's most definitely a sense of larger community here that's not often found elsewhere. So I think those very much speak to rare positive qualities that you see in this community. Unfortunately, I think that's just about all the positive stuff I might have to say for the rest of the interview. But anyway, like I said, I didn't listen to the entire thing, but there was an assortment of speakers. I heard Rabbi Waxman, who was, spoke at one of the school Shabbos in my high school. I think he wasn't as like famous and well-known then. Rabbi Sintarshish from Nuve spoke. She actually taught me when I was in Nuve, so she was my teacher. I recognized her. Rabbi Elia Barvachvogel, who is the Rosh Hashiva of South Fallsburg. One of my brothers attended there. I'm certain I've gone out with a couple of boys from there too. He spoke and there was like a narrator. You know, there was a female narrator. There were some songs that were very reminiscent of my high school Shabbos. You know, inspiring. Like I've seen this stuff before. And then there was was also a male narrator here and there. Sometimes there was a female narrator, sometimes it was a male narrator. So it was a mix. It was definitely a mix. The approach was very similar to all of these inspiring events, or most of them. Very appealing to people's emotions as much as you can. Not really like somebody having a rational conversation with you about, look, these are the pros of social media. These are the cons of social media. You have to weigh them against each other and you have to manage it somehow. That was not the conversation. It was a lot of fire and brimstone and what people like to call inspirational fluff. Emotional appeal, like when they, yeah. when you have advertising, you want to yeah. stick in children and puppies because, yeah. Yeah. And a lot about the Yiddish mama and things like that. So that was the overall general approach. The messages that kind of were emphasized and that are sticking out in my mind are there was this focus on Instagram more than other types of social media platforms. And I, I don't think that that's coincidental. I, th I think there's a good reason for it. We can get to it later. Some speakers made it seem very black and white. I think like, if I recall correctly, Rav Wachtvogel, it was very black and white, like the internet is terrible. There was no how to manage, how to regulate. I don't remember exactly where I wax mean. Uh, Rav Tarshish, it was more like, it's a super powerful tool, atomic bomb type of thing, and we need to know how to manage it and you have to be so careful type of message. So there was some room in what Rebbe Tarshish was saying 
for like, okay, maybe this is something that we can manage, like you're managing a nuclear reactor or something. But like Ravach Vogel, it was the internet is terrible type of message, if I remember correctly. So those were basically the messages. So on the chat, we were talking a lot about women are just always told to go hide and be more sneers and the classic talking points that we use anytime anything mm-hmm. controversial happens. And then a lot of the women who attended kept saying they didn't talk about sneers. They didn't tell you what to do. They didn't go out right and black and white anything. Right. So they were very intelligent and careful about not using the word sneers or banning the internet. They were careful and smart enough not to make any blanket statements that would turn off so many people. They were I didn't very- even notice that. I mean, the messages were loud and clear, but sure. Okay. <laughs> and that's what I what, what I heard from women. Like no that one said, be. delete your accounts. They, they <gasps> just showed you videos of people of like mothers not hearing their kids because they're on their phones and they just don't hear them until the fifth, sixth time they say, mommy, mommy. And that just made women cringe and feel so sad and realize that that's what they're doing. Yeah, you touched on something important that I think, well, I want to clarify at least where my opinion stands on this. Why did they make the Sasifa? Did they make the Sasifa because they're worried that mothers aren't connecting with their children? I don't think so. That's not what the Sasifa was about. I think there are two things that worry leadership. One of them is the lack of sneeze or if it's okay to use grown-up words, access to things like pornography, which of course is completely understandable that religious leaders would be worried about it. And the sneeze boundaries that might be crossed. So like access, that's one. And two, they're worried because the internet is an enormous challenge to leadership authority. So I think those are the two main issues they care about. But obviously it's not gonna have great appeal to just focus on those things for a lot of reasons. And of course, the whole sneeze, there's more awareness about how all this sneeze talk triggers women and it's not good and all that. So now you bring in that argument that eat kosher food because it's healthy argument. Oh, it's you're not connecting with your children and you can get addicted to it. Like they're not worried about addictions. There are a hundred other addictions we can worry about. It's not like internet addiction is one special addiction we're worried about. I think the whole trying to sell the Sasifa as a way to disengage from social media so that you're there for your children is a little bit dishonest. Because it's not really what they're after, at least in my opinion. Well, another point that kept coming up for women was the business accounts that did shut down following the SIFA. They were already hating social media and not liking spending all that time on it, creating content for it. And they were just like, this is the perfect excuse to just pull the trigger and shut down the account and capitalize on what's going on, earn some points, meaning There are a lot of parts of social media that are harder for women. For example, like body image. If you listen to any experts talk about the difference between TikTok, for example, and Instagram, Instagram is created to look perfect and nice. The filters, everything is presented. TikTok, the the videos that go viral are usually much more raw and in the spur of the moment, not curated and beautiful. So that was messing with women's self-esteem maybe their marriages, maybe how they felt about themselves. And yeah, maybe they're distracted from their kids, which is a side point. They were very unhappy and jealous. And those feelings, people who identify with feeling that may have used that as inspiration to either shut down their Instagram account or take a break from social media or figure out some other ways to deal with it. Yeah. Also, some of these people are people with businesses that are already flourishing and very established. So maybe it's not for them to step away from social media. But for someone who's on the upswing of starting a business or it's expecting them to shut down an account is very, very different than somebody who's already already has like years of success behind them. I didn't like the whole let's display people who did this thing because I don't know, it's almost reminiscent of like what a cult would do or like mob rule where you take someone and like you bring them up to the stage. And I, I hate to sound irreverent, but like Rav Amnon Yitzhak, like cutting off pace on a stage to cheer everybody on. Like, I don't know. Is that how you get people to change? Like, it just didn't sit well with me. I think the focus on Instagram was very related to what just happened on Instagram a couple of months ago where women banded together with the free Chava movement, let's help Agunos. I don't think it's coincidental that now Instagram became a little bit of a target because it's a challenge to leadership and authority. And it's also a place that the leadership and authority, they're not skulking around Instagram, so they don't even know what's going on. They can't police it. They can't make rules for people to follow. Women could just be on their own and have a voice without being policed, which is 
important because, or significant because they're so heavily policed in general between not having their images and publications, which is a very big deal in my opinion, because we're not going to reconstruct human psychology to make an ad without a picture and without good graphics as good as an ad that does have a nice picture of an agent or whatever. Like that's just not going to happen no matter how much people try. They're not really in public leadership roles, definitely not that much in spiritual roles. Even most girls schools, like they're not even on the boards of girls schools. So women are very, very limited in their scope. Instagram became a place for them to have a voice. Telling women to get off the platform without giving them an alternative. Yeah. If in this large gathering, they said something like, we understand that Instagram is giving you a voice and that Instagram is empowering you and doing this and this for you. Let's try to minimize that. And instead, we're going to give you a voice. We're going to give you a voice in our community. That would be a completely different approach and a completely different story. But that's not what they did. Not only did no one said that, but no one even spoke about it. Nobody even acknowledged that. Not one person acknowledged that a woman can't have her face in a newspaper or a magazine, but she can have her face on Instagram. Nobody acknowledged that. Nobody acknowledged all of the empowerment and things that women can do on Instagram. Nobody acknowledged the women who got their guts because of the campaign that went viral on Instagram. No one mentioned all the money that was raised for all kinds of organizations. That too. Thanks to influencers who have the power to just post something on their stories and raise a ton of money. And this brings us back to, I think what I've said on the last podcast, at the things that are central in this culture, the things that are right in the middle are things like tinius and men not having inappropriate thoughts. Put them on a scale. In this world, it's more important for men not to view inappropriate material than it is for a woman to get a get on some level. If you put those two on a scale, in this world, the side of a man viewing inappropriate material completely tips the other side of women having a voice a campaign that helps women get get women running businesses that help support families. That's where the scale tips in that world. And that tells you their priorities. It's funny because every time you mention leadership, leadership, I'm always seeing lack of leadership. Anytime I ask a rabbi to speak about something, he's like, I'm not qualified. Who says I'm a leader? And it's this like disownment. But clearly the people who spoke at this event see themselves as leaders. And these are the messages that they're giving. Before we move on to the people who were able to create a business, have a voice, and all the other positive things that come out of women being on Instagram, I'd like to just say why, after speaking to somebody who was so inspired by the event, I still had a hard time listening to what she was saying, and maybe other people feel the same way. Somehow, if a doctor or a therapist or a coach or a teacher or a sibling or a parent says something about, I notice I'm spending too much time online, or you watch a movie on Netflix, like The Social Dilemma, and then you're like, you know what? Good point. They, they are controlling what I'm seeing and my ads, and maybe I'm spending too much time. Maybe I'm giving away too much information. Maybe I'm sharing too much. And then you start questioning your behaviors and maybe putting a time filter on your phone. Flatbush girl Adina Miles definitely said she's pro time filters, not the social media filters. Because we do need to self-regulate and we do need to learn those behaviors just like we do with everything else. I know I'm really hoping to bring this up on the podcast around male sexuality and halacha, how they have to learn how to self-regulate when it comes to thoughts and then sexual urges. And that's not part of the discussion. But for example, we don't ban alcohol because we have a substance abuse issue. We are still using Kiddush every Friday night wine. And we have the Arba Kosos, the four cups of wine. And, and we don't just ban things because there's potential for risk. We learn how to swim. We learn how to navigate those waters. And we're all about empowering, teaching, educating. Why shouldn't that be the approach also with social media? So for me, what was hard is the fact that it's coming from rabbis, for coming from religious leaders. Somehow it felt like my mind couldn't accept those kinds of suggestions. Whereas if it would come from secular media, I'd be much more open to hearing, oh, you know what? It is a good idea to be more aware of like, how much time we spend on our phones. Are we paying attention to our kids when they're talking to us? Do we put our phones away on date night, et cetera? Which I actually did a couple of years ago. My phone's on silent now all the time because it just beeps way too many times and you have that 
dopamine, little pushes of dopamine. (laughs) So I couldn't handle that. And when I'm on my phone, I'll see that people call me. But if I'm not on my phone, you can't reach me. And it just is what it is. Yeah. I think you're bringing up a great point and this touches to what I said. I really don't think the people organizing this event, the people speaking at this event, I don't think they're concerned with what you're bringing up. Like that wasn't the point of this event. It wasn't to teach you about self-regulation and how to minimize the addictive effect of social media, which are, by the way, all excellent points that we should all consider. And I, I would consider it myself. I'm actually not a big Instagram person for that reason, because it's so visual and so fast and so dopamine rush. But I don't think that's what they were after. I think they were after the tzniest porn part, and they were after the challenge to religious authority. And then the parts about, oh, it's not good for you. Like I said, it's like eat kosher because it's healthy. So can you talk more about the tzniest and the challenge leadership? Because so many people said they never use the word tzniest and they never use the word, you know, certain keywords. When a rabbi yells, and I'm not quoting anyone, but I'm just getting a gist of what was said. The biggest threat to the kedusha of the bias and how many marriages have been ruined. They're talking about when in their mind they see porn ruining a marriage, for example, or other things. That's what they're talking about. Women looking at porn? When that person said it, they meant probably a man. But I don't know if you have a discussion with them, maybe women too. Because in general, in that world, the focus of the sexuality is on the man and all the man's sexual urges. The woman is like a by the way when it comes to discussions about the sexual attraction and urges and all that. That's what I think anyway. Yeah, I don't think this event was about self-regulation and all those things that you're mentioning. I really think it was about that and also challenge to authority because there are blogs and people challenge authority. And I was actually, this was expected. It wasn't like I expected them to talk about this. It would have been nice and again, completely unrealistic for someone to acknowledge that the only reason sexual abuse is being addressed the way it is and at the forefront right now of issues that are taken seriously is because of the internet bloggers. It's because the blogs did all this. Outside of that, we might still be where we were, I don't know, 20 years ago or or whatnot. Which is directly threatening my work as a musician. (laughs) We'll talk about Kalisha and as a podcaster and activist. Right. And I think it's just awful because what's on their radar as the critical issues of the day should be things like sexual abuse and other things. There was no mention of it. The other point that you touched on was like, why did they not talk about SNES outright or whatever? They never really talk about sexuality outright ever. It's all euphemisms and rimuzim and like words and like you sort of figure out what they're saying. But there's never a point blank discussion with grown up words that happens definitely not in public and even in private. I mean, the banning of lace shaitals was a very direct sneeze ban. Yeah, but no one's going to talk about sex or sexuality. And no one's going to even say the word pornography, even in this talk, even though that's what they're talking about. Or they're not even going to say the word a woman in a bikini, for example. It's like you can't even talk about the elephant in the room, but you're yelling about the elephant in the room. I still don't understand how women having Instagram means men watch porn. It doesn't, but it means men like viewing pictures of attractive women and women who are seductive. And then the videos, it's not porn, but like there's there's definitely stuff on Instagram that's like would be considered very inappropriate. So the women having the phones mean that the men have the phones. It's that my wife has Instagram, so I'm scrolling her account. And then once I'm scrolling on her account, I'm just going to go to the reels. And now I'm seeing a bunch of inappropriate videos. And then I see this, I don't know, this hot model that I really like. And then I'm looking her up here and I'm looking her up there. And I don't know. And it goes places. And it's completely warranted for religious leaders to talk about that and have discussions about it. But I don't think this is the way to do it. To yell and scream about the kadusha of the home and the marriages that are broken. This whole appeal to emotions, it touches a raw nerve in me because a teenager, I was still a teenager. I experienced this on multiple occasions because this is what I was immersed in. The sort of getting swept up in that emotional, you, you get this like euphoric rush. You're part of something larger than yourself. You're part of this group and you're going somewhere great and you're going to be great and all that talk about Mashiach. And I got swept up into it multiple times, whether it was school Shabbos or an inspirational event. So I completely understand that you get a dopamine rush from that too. <laughs> yeah, a big dopamine rush from that too. But during one of those times, it actually led to me making a decision, which 
I don't think now would be the right forum to discuss it, but I, I made a decision that had very far reaching consequences and a very significant impact on me, you know, and sort of took my life in a certain direction that I later was very unhappy of later as my brain matured and understood what happened and why I made that decision and why it appealed to me and how all the emotions played out when you piece it together rationally. So I'm just not a fan of people making decisions that way and people getting swept up in usually inspirational waves and rushes without like having a rational conversation with yourself or in your head about what's happening and why you're making decisions. It's just funny that the women who attended felt like it was about social media regulation. I mean, I spoke to just a few, so I haven't spoken to 20,000. <laughs> yeah, I think that was like, you want to give your kid medicine and they're just not going to take the medicine. So you just crush it and stick it into some applesauce. And you're like, here, take some applesauce. I don't think that that's what the leadership really cares about in, in this particular endeavor. And I made this connection. I don't know if anyone else connected this, but two weeks before that event, there was this event here in Philly, actually, at the Wells Fargo Center to empower and to celebrate the learning of Torah and this whole Lakewood event, which has nothing to do with the women's event. But it was just interesting how they happened both at stadiums, two weeks apart, one for women, one for men, about empowering and talking about Kedusha and your role. And yeah, just a side point. Let's talk about self-expression and women having a voice and a face on Instagram. And I find it so interesting. And I'll quote Chaim Seaman on this. No one outright went and said there's no Kalisha for example, that's an example relevant to my life. We just found the back door and then we were on borrowed time where no one knew it was happening. And we created our own space and we normalized women are able to have a voice and sing. And it's on the men not to listen or not to watch, but there's no mitzvah for women to shut up. Women found a voice. And what's very interesting from the research that I've been doing with the podcast and meeting so many women in the arts and entertainment was that the women who were singing were like, oh, wow, there's finally a place where I can put my music and other women could find me. And I finally have a way to reach them. It didn't come from a place. We are done with this halacha and it's just not cool anymore. And they are the most from Rebbitson inspiring women almost to the point where they're always apologizing for doing their music. Not all of them, but there's this idea is I'm doing this because I'm meant to inspire and help and uplift other people. As opposed to like my mantra is I do this because I need to, I love to, and it doesn't even matter to me if anyone's listening to my music or not. Obviously it does. And I love that people listen. That's not why I keep doing it. For me, it's about I can't hold it back and I'd be miserable if I would shut this part of myself down and I have to nurture this part of myself. So you have this whole unrebellious segment of the Jewish from women population that found a place that's so beautiful, inspiring, kadosh, not rebellious. Like there's not one ounce of rebelliousness. If anyone's rebellious, I'll raise my hand and accept that I'm probably one of the most rebellious in terms of what I do out there. And I have intentions behind it. I do want to push some boundaries to make it safer for the other people to be able to just do the regular stuff. But I did bring it up on the chat I'm on with many other singers. And many of them were very inspired by the event as well. And they weren't even upset about it the way I was. And I was surprised, but not surprised. I was happy to hear that, that they weren't as bitter as I was. And then you had obviously the people who ignored it completely and thought these rabbis aren't talking to them. But somebody did bring up how schools and camps will not be hiring singers who have social media presence. And this could really impact their livelihood. And then to which they said livelihood comes from Hashem. Yeah, but and that, that, I, that I'm going to interrupt you for a second about that livelihood comes from Hashem. That whole argument is really ridiculous because if livelihood comes from Hashem and that's your argument, then why are these people so successful in their livelihood on Instagram now? So like that argument makes no sense at all. I just have to throw that in. I do believe that on many levels. I also believe there are some people who just manifest it with their open clea and money somehow pours into their lives. 
But most people, and if you listen to this podcast, you'll see lots of people suffering. And yes, Hashem helps. But then life's hard and there's a lot of suffering and there are a lot of bad things that happen. So even though livelihood comes from Hashem, doesn't always come and doesn't always come when you need it most. And you do have responsibility and there is an idea of ishtadlus. It's a Jewish word. <laughs> it's not a secular word. Yeah. yeah no, no one can make you a promise that if you shut down your Instagram account, it's not going to impact your business. Nobody can make you that promise. That I know that's a common thing. A lot of my high school and seminary teachers did this. The promise is like, oh, if you do what Hashem wants, then of course Hashem is going to reward you. It doesn't pan out like that in real life. That's just not how it works. And a lot of people, will, when it doesn't happen, they're going to be like, well, just wait for the bracha, wait for the bracha. That's just not how it works in reality. And the people who are making promises, and especially to vulnerable people who believe them and are listening, I think it's really, really wrong. Back to the women who are not rebellious, are not trying to be immodest. You're like dredging up this thought I've had for a while that I've been thinking about how and I'm talking about the world I grew up in, like Haredi, Borough Park, Beis Yaakov. So obviously this is not true for the whole firm world. How do they see women and what their role in life is? Primary lens you're seeing through is a mother, a wife, someone who helps build a family, someone who helps your husband. But there isn't much of a focus on self-expression, a self-actualization as a human being in the same way that like men have that. Well, men only have that in the form of learning. True. That's true, like learning Torah as an, an intellectual pursuit, but there's still more leeway as far as giving men that opportunity for a job. There are more firm doctors, there are lawyers, community leaders, all sorts of different things, Hatzala members. And for women, that's just not the discussion. It's about building a bias on base role, getting married as young as possible, very large families from a young age. That's where the focus is. I don't think that this segment of the firm world I'm talking about really sees women as people who need self-expression and self-actualization the same way a man does. They don't think she needs it. So of course it's not a big deal to them. Like, why do you need Instagram? What? Why do you have to sing? I don't think they really understand that in that regard, men and women are not that different. People don't only find happiness and expression in their life through building a family. It's not pitting one against the other. It's not like career outside world versus family inside world. That's like pitting the heart against the brain. What do you need to live? What's more important? That's a ridiculous question. It's like the heart of a human being. Being a human being for both men and women is not just about relationships and family. People need expression in other ways. People find that expression through art, through their job. For me, my, my job is a huge one. And I remember the contrast of like going from, it was a very slow transition, right? From like shelter to be a girl, then to teaching in a cure school, then to like working in a, in a secular lab, to medical school. But the contrast of going from a world, where I was basically summed up as a mother and a wife, which there's nothing, there's, I, I am a mother and a wife. I, I'm not saying that we shouldn't give that to women, but going to a world where the need for self-expression and the need for self-actualization, like there's not much of a difference between a man and a woman when it comes to that. Human experience. Yeah, human experience. Like men and women are not that different. The way I grew up, it wasn't that important that I was like reading Sparim or writing Divrei Torah or it was like a chisaro. Like, why are you doing that? Like, don't you want to marry someone normal? Intellectual curiosity is not, wasn't valued. Whereas in, when I transferred, had a foot in the other world, people respected that you're not a weirdo or like you don't have like a problem if you're intellectual and you like to read and things like that. An agenda. You're a feminist. Yeah. I, those I, are I, words. To... Those are, to be honest, it's very insulting and it, it's very dehumanizing, right? To tell a woman that, you know, because you want to read a safer or learn Gemara or because you want to be involved in intellectual pursuits that you have some sort of agenda. Like, I don't know. I have the same exact agenda as the man right next to me. Why does the fact that I'm a woman now label that as an agenda? Whereas a man can do that and somehow he has the right intentions. I don't know that it's coming from a bad or evil place. It's definitely coming from lack of understanding and just a lack of knowledge. If you've never sat down and spoken to a woman and if you don't interact much with a woman, you're just going to think she's, I don't know, your, your image of what this creature is is going to be different than the reality. But in this world, it's not that important for you to have self-expression. We have other priorities. It's not that important for you, Francisca, to be singing. It's not that important for you, Efra, to find fulfillment in being a doctor or writing or whatever. Those are not your roles anyway. I, I even had people who I admired and respect when I was applying to medical school tell me at the end of the day, your job is really to be a wife and a mother. Like that's what you're 
task it is from people who very much like respected my work in Kiro. People tell me that. So I think the fact that they're trying to wipe women off Instagram, it's just a natural outgrowth of not thinking women need this stuff anyway. And taking another thing away and limiting and inhibiting instead of providing solutions, which I would like to do now, if that's okay. One of the reasons this was so painful to see happen was I know probably the most successful women performances have been, I think one time I heard a Chabad event, 10,000 women, and there was a female performer at a stadium. She was performing in front of 10,000 women. Another one I heard of was this past Cholmoed in Florida. There were 5,000 women for a concert with several female singers, 10 of live stream. But most of the time, most singers, maybe they pull up a few hundred women and that's a successful event. And I was just thinking if we're banning Instagram, right, let's say, why not have an event for women where it's just as okay to take a night off and go somewhere and you have female entertainers and you have maybe a from fashion show and you have some other things, maybe some alcohol and mixed drinks for the women so they can have a night out off of social media where they could enjoy the women's industry that is Jewish and beautiful and inspiring and modest for those people who need to add that into everything. But no, it was a bunch of speeches and guilt and shame and emotional emotional manipulation. manipulation. <laughs> I'm going to get so much hate for that. But that that's it, it hurt. But 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 what? it really is. Because I recognize this stuff. I've experienced it. I've internalized it. I've made life choices based on it. There definitely was some emotional manipulation there. It's just so hard to pull off events that are providing the space and platforms. And then when you want to fight it and ban it, suddenly there are 20,000 women. That was like this stab in the heart type of... I hear that. <laughs> That's what I mean... it felt like for me last week. And I just feel like it's so therapeutic for me to be able to share this with our audience on this episode, talking about the work I've been doing with all the guests over the last four and a half years to talk about the real issues, not because I'm trying to air dirty laundry, which someone accused me today of like, you have this agenda and you, your, your titles are just so provocative. And so I'm like, I'm doing this because the rabbis aren't talking about this enough. And there's so much good that's happening behind the scenes of this podcast and so many other podcasts that are happening and the other influencers, the work they're doing. Again, the Aguna situation, all the fundraising that's happening from fashion. And there's so much awareness The the parents today, the women today are so much more empowered today because of all the information we're able to curate to them through the internet. No one's giving anyone a pat on the back and saying, congratulations, the women today are so powerful and they've done so much good and they created leadership spaces for themselves. Right. I know a lot of people are not going to like what I'm going to say, but clearly everything we're speaking about played into my decision to not raise my children in that community. Like this, this stuff at some point became a deal breaker for me. I'm like, I don't want this for my children. And you're still from just for everyone yeah. listening. <laughs> Yeah, I, I consider myself orthodox. I don't want my girls growing up in a world where this is the focus. I want the focus for them to be, what can I what can I achieve in my life? How do I best hide myself? Am I following the rules? How do I make sure a man never has a lustful thought about me? That's not what I want dictating my girls' lives. I don't want them to live like that. A point I wanted to bring in, this also happened on the chat, on the discussion group. There was this video by Rabbi Schaefer, right? Was it mm -hmm. Rabbi Schaefer? Yeah. Spoke mm -hmm. about the dangers of couple meals, Shabbos couple meals. I think it wasn't specified on the video, but I think he was speaking to newly married couples, like maybe two, three months or a few weeks, having double dates, basically, where you have mm -hmm. two on two. And that just had everyone talking back and forth and yelling and screaming with zero volume. It was interesting because I do agree that there was some truth to what he's saying, meaning somebody who barely knows their own husband or you barely know your wife, you're married two and a half seconds and now you're spending three hour meals with another couple and you get into deep, meaningful conversations and whatever, and their shaita looks just right. Right. That was that was <laughs> an example. It could be very hard for a new marriage to survive that. And that leads to quick divorces 
I'm not even talking about infidelity here. We're talking about thoughts, conflict, arguments, divorce. He was seeing it from the man's perspective. And then I commented on LinkedIn. He was like, oh, it can be the same for the woman. Okay. But basically a guy will see the the other wife and maybe she'll look perfect and maybe she's having a great day and she looks wonderful and her makeup is on point and maybe his wife had a hard day and she's hired and she won't look good and he'll compare. I think obviously, I think everybody would agree that there should be some sort of boundaries between you know, any male and female who's married and boundaries between other males and females. But those are very community specific, very couple specific. I just think what Rabbi Schaefer was saying is was very assumed. It's like very superficial and immature. Like, is that the relationship? It's based on like what someone's makeup looks like. What is she to like? Every normal adult understands that some people have good days and some people have hard days and some days people have bad hair days and people don't always look their best. And every married person knows that there are people in the world who look better than their spouse, who are smarter than their spouse, who are more giving than their spouse, who are kinder. Like there's always going to be someone better out there. And if, if you don't understand that, then like, I don't know. That's just like a really, that's just immature. I think he took it a bit too far. A lot of the people getting married are immature. I mean, those are challenges that are going to come up at some point, but that's a community specific thing. I can understand that in some communities, that's like you're crossing the boundaries, but in some communities, like what he said would be seen as ridiculous. Like in my community, I, I would see that as ridiculous. Now, if we had a couple over and someone was inappropriate or we got the sense someone was trying to cross boundaries, that's a very different story. But just plain having people over in a combined setting, I, I really think he was he was going overboard there. On the flip end, what I think is what the community tries to do is limit, limit, close off, ban. Whereas the reason in your community, for example, or my community, it's totally normalized and not looked down upon is because men are so exposed to women at school, at work. We we interact with women and men here to the point where you're thinking of these people as, oh, that's so-and-so's mother or that's so-and-so's sister. And, and that's my doctor's wife. And they're humanized to the point where they're desexualized. It, I, I know I'm a woman. I don't get to say that. The men get to say this because we don't know what their experience is like. But I've heard men say how getting to know people and then how their shade looks that day doesn't make an impression because they see them as a whole person. They see them as a person and not as a sexual being exclusively. Yeah. Like I'm not here to tell anyone how to live, but I know that for my own children, I don't want that. I don't want them to live in a very segregated society because I just, I don't think it's healthy. I, I do think it over-sexualizes women. Do you have any ideas? Let's say there are rabbis listening here and they're like, you know what? We want to have a spiritual event. We do want to show up as the leaders that the women in our community need. How do we do this better next time? I think they have to start listening to their women. And that's one, like really listening to the women. And two, you have to start letting women slowly advance to leadership. Because if you don't have representation of women, you're just not going to get their perspective. You can't seal the leadership up from women. Rose and Tarshish spoke at this event. Fine. She's a speaker. But I highly doubt any woman was up there at the top and calling the shots or had a sit down discussion. I don't know. Maybe it did happen, actually. But I don't know. Did she have anything to do with the behind the scenes of this event? When you seal off a population from leadership and from leadership roles, you're not going to be able to really hear them. And I know people are going to argue, well, they can't be post given they can't be rabbis. So without even get, getting into that discussion, there would be many creative ways where you could allow women in the leadership without giving them official roles that you think they shouldn't be getting. That would be a totally separate discussion. There are ways to give women a voice. When we were in high school, so we had female teachers, but like all the people at the top were all men. Right? In modern Orthodox communities, I think they're shifting a little bit there. Yeah. Yeah. So the difference between the Haredi communities and the modern Orthodox communities in, in, on this issue, because both are not perfect. In the Haredi community, women are sealed off. And to some extent, the men think that women are not as intellectually strong as men. There is this concept of Nashim Dat and Kalos. Like I was, I was always seen as an anomaly because I was intellectually curious. That's not how the men view women. They don't think women are capable of being in these leadership roles. In the modern Orthodox community, that's not how the men think. 
the men think that the women are just as smart, they're just as capable, but we want to be loyal to the Masorah, we want to be loyal to Halacha, and how do we deal with this challenge? But if not for the Halacha and wanting to be loyal to the Masorah, in the modern Orthodox world, women long would have been rabbis already and long would have been in leadership roles. Because it's clear and obvious to everyone that women are just as capable. And in many cases, when it comes to certain things, women are more capable. But that's not how it is in the Haredi world. In the Haredi world, your typical man thinks a woman does not belong there and that a woman is incapable of being there. This was a discussion that was very validating for me, and I feel like it had to happen. I just want to acknowledge that the event did take place. They were successful at getting stadium filled with women, so many of them being inspired, taking action. Leadership clearly works, their leadership when they use it. And it's dangerous or it's scary. And I'm curious to see how it's going to affect the social media and Instagram space going forward. Are women going to close down their accounts? Are they going to lose business because half of their followers are gone overnight? Are they going to be more resentful? Are they going to find another way to do it? Are they going to pop back on six months later after they close down their accounts? I'm curious what's going to happen. I do feel podcasts are unique because it's audio only. We use social media to promote it. So we might need more word of mouth help here to get more people listening. But the idea is not to, hey, look at me, check out how I look, but listen to the issues that come up in your life and let's do something about it. I hope good things come. Going <laughs> forward, let's see what happens. Thank you for having me. Always a pleasure. Thank you for listening until the end. I am so grateful that to be releasing my 200th episode today. If you enjoyed the show, please do help spread the word. Follow the show on your favorite podcast app. Check out the backlog. Check out the other podcasts on jewishcoffeehouse.com. And of course, if you or anyone you know who's looking for podcast support, please do reach out. I'd love to help. Don't forget to check out my new song, Kol Isha. The link is in the show notes and keep reaching out and offering to share your personal, beautiful, unique stories on the show. I am so honored to be able to offer my platform to create more awareness, removing judgment and stigma around so many of the challenges in our community. See you next time.